So my name is Pablo uh, Delgado. I work at OpenTable as a senior data engineer. Um, how many of you here know what OpenTable is or use OpenTable? Yeah, oh, OK, like a 1,000 people in the room. Good. Well, I don't know, maybe less. Um, this is um, OpenTable in numbers. We have uh, 32,000 restaurants worldwide. Um, we provide a, a seating for 16 million diners every month. Um, we have a presence in many countries, US, Canada, Mexico, Germany, UK, and Japan. Uh, and we have um, activity with a lot of par partners. Um, OpenTable um, it used to be a transactional site only. So you go to OpenTable to book a table, and that's it. And we are transforming OpenTable into a, um, a, a site that will power the best dining experiences. So I'm going to talk about the two things uh, that um, are concerned with the mesos. Uh, one is the service-oriented architecture, and the other one is the data processing. Um, we started uh, serving our site with a monolithic architecture, uh, you know, uh, a big fat application that uh, it's deployed. Um, and we turned this monolithic uh, site into several microservices. Um, there were a lot of difficulties uh, uh, growing at the scale we're, 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 we're trying. Uh, and at the time, uh, a year ago, uh, we started playing with Mesos. Um, so most of you already know what Mesos is, so I'm not going to talk uh, much about it. Uh, but I will quote these papers if you want to get them for, for reference. Um, I tried to change this to the new nomenclature that is Mesos Master and Mesos Agent. Um, and I, I put the slide here so we can see the components of Mesos. Um, uh, we have the Zookeeper Quorum, uh, the Mesos Masters, and the Standbys, and several agents. And the agents are agnostic uh, about what they run, run and, and the agents only are announcing how many resources they have available, and it's uh, up to the Mesos Master to uh, forward these resources to the schedulers. In this case, in the figure, we have a Hadoop and MPI scheduler, but we're going to talk about the scheduler we use at OpenTable that is Singularity. Um, the way we uh, kind of architected uh, Mesos, we compacted the zookeepers with them, uh, uh, collocated the zookeeper with the master. So we have uh, three machines that are Mesos masters and zookeepers. And we added the Netflix exhibitor to every one of them to uh, watchdog the zookeepers um, and take a little bit of babysitting on the, on the logs and and if uh, you can restart a uh, uh, zookeeper very easily. Um, also, we have uh, several slaves, uh, and the slaves are super pristine. They just have a, um, the Mesos uh, agent. I forgot to change the slide. And the Docker daemon. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Hub, HubSpot uh, Singularity Scheduler. Um, we used this scheduler uh, because it provided these features. Uh, it, it got native uh, Docker support, uh, JSON REST API, so it was very easy for us to script uh, our way into the scheduler. Um, full feature web application, so we have a, a web UI that uh, it's very easy for newcomers to understand uh, what's going on. Uh, and we have uh, automatic deployments and rollbacks, so if something goes wrong with a deploy, it rolls back to the previous. Um, and we have a uh, health checks um, to um, whenever we launch uh, processes. Um, also, we have a uh, configurable alerts, so people get notified about uh, the status of their task or, or, or their deployments. In a snapshot, this is uh, what uh, HubSpot Singularity is. Uh, it provides uh, four service um, process types, um, web services, um, so you you get a hold on an IP and a port. Workers, you don't you don't get a port, so it, it's just for running demons. Uh, schedule jobs, uh, you have a cron cron type syntax, 
and you can schedule the running, the recurrent running of a job. And there's also the on-demand process. The on-demand process is just you have the definition of the process and you trigger the execution whenever you want from outside the scheduler. Also, we have a slave placement. So every time you deploy, you can choose between greedy, optimistic, or, or separate. Uh, separate lets you say, say you have three uh, instances of your deploy. Separate will try to co uh, locate them in different slaves. Um, and greedy tries to grab uh, as much resources uh, as it can for one of the slaves. So you can co-locate all your deploys in one slave. Um, we also have uh, the different type of executors, the message executors that already comes with it, singularity executor that we're not using, uh, and Docker, the Docker executor that it's the one we, we choose. Um, we run uh, everything in, inside Linux containers um, in the flavor of Docker containers. Um, I'm not going to dive too much into Docker because you know most of the people in this room maybe know about it, but I will just uh, recall that it's very easy for developers to uh, build and ship uh, their applications, and I rescue the the concept of immutability, so everything gets back into a blob and, and deploy in your cluster. Portability, so it runs here and there and everywhere. And the isolation. Um, so now that we have a, a scheduler, tasks, and everything in Docker containers, we deploy in a cluster and we need a, a way to find our, our applications. Uh, so we have something called service discovery. Um, um, service discovery is a registry for dynamically figuring out where the, your applications live in the cluster. It's also a service that lives outside Mesos. It's Mesos agnostic, so it lets us also route uh, traffic or discover uh, um, applications that live outside Mesos. Uh, so it, it, it helped us uh, migrate from uh, the previous way of deploying to the new way of deploying uh, within Mesos. Uh, normally, you do a service announces their presence. So as soon as you boot up, uh, you announce to the service discovery server uh, that you exist somewhere. Then you can subscribe to changes. So if you have dependencies that you need to call, uh, you subscribe to changes. And if they change location in the network, you, you automatically know the, uh, the table gets updated for you. And then when you terminate or crash, you un announce, you stop announcing that you exist. So the, the table gets uh, pruned as well. Um, so more graphically, uh, if you have a, an application A deployed in the cluster anywhere, you just have the blue arrows that announce to, to the service discovery that it's a bucket with a um, embedded zookeeper. Uh, and then other application B that wants to call application A just uh, discovers them by the routing, routing table that uh, application B found over the dotted line by connecting to, to discovery. So it's, it's very simple. It's just published to a registry, and then you subscribe to the registry to figure out where, where to find things. Um, it, it turns out that this is uh, also a proven solution uh, that was existing at the Ning. So it works very well, and it scales very well. This is the API. You announce, uh, then you find somebody, uh, and then you can create a request uh, to that service. We also route traffic from the outside uh, via a um, software uh, piece that is called Frontdoor. And here's the diagram. Frontdoor is a set of uh, HTTP servers, proxies, that um, are discovery aware, so they know the location of all the services that we run in infrastructure. So when you hit front door with a particular request, front door figures out where the service lives and routes the traffic to it. It's very, it supports dynamic configuration, so while the server is running, we can change the configuration. And it's also developer friendly via Git repository, so everyone in the company can register a change in the, in the, in the front door and we have uh, the history of commits, and, and we can blame who did what. Um, also, front doors and discoveries uh, instances live inside the cluster. So they're floating, if you want. Monitoring, uh, all of this becomes 
very, very big, very uh, fast. So we have many, many instances of many, many applications. So you need to figure out what's going on. The monitoring the machine alone, it's no longer uh, viable. You also need to monitor what's going on inside the containers. So um, one of our engineers did uh, this monitoring solution that you can grab from uh, Kit. Oh. Well, you will get the slides later. It, it says Mesostats. Uh, and it's a, a series of uh, scripts that fetch from, from Mesos statistics and parses all the tasks and, and gets you the, the application name uh, and provides these uh, beautiful Grafana dashboards that you can, you can figure out what your application is doing. You can see the graph uh, in the bottom is uh, memory. So when your memory gets to a peak, the application gets killed and responds somewhere else. And when, when you get to a peak, it gets killed. Uh, this is one of my applications. Uh, so we, we provide a Windows approach to scalability that it's a reset or reboot and you start again. Um, watching it all together, it looks like a, a, like a diagram. Uh, with GitHub being the source of the code, uh, we have uh, templates for continuous integration. And the, uh, the process of continuous integration, in our case, is Team City. Um, we produce an artifact that is uh, stored in the Docker registry, and we trigger a deploy to Singularity. Singularity then, in turn, asks uh, the Mesos um, cluster, where can I place these uh, tasks? As soon as the tasks or the, or, the, or the applications boot up, they announce to the discovery, and then front door can start the directing traffic to them. Um, the good thing about this is that uh, you start dividing the, the, the developer concerns uh, from the ops concerns. So if you are a developer in our company, you only need to worry about the GitHub and Team City integration and Team City template that provides a, a deploy script to launch your application. So you only think of this, and your problems exist within this domain. Um, if you are in the operation side, uh, you only need to care about providing more resources to Mesos or subtracting resources from, from Mesos, monitoring the traffic and figuring if front door is up or if the discovery servers are, are, are running correctly. Um, the, other, the other option that we took is uh, we have a very much a stateless Mesos cluster. We don't rely on anything you write in the file system. We don't run data stores inside the Mesos cluster. We don't run uh, memcache instances or, or Redis. Uh, all of those uh, run outside the cluster. So we have uh, MySQL, Postgres, Mongos, or uh, cache instances, and Zookeeper and Amazon S3. Uh, the simplicity of the stateless uh, lets you treat the, the slave as immutable pieces and the application are immutable blobs. So n none, of thing, none of this is important. You can kill a, a slave and all the applications migrate to other, other places. Uh, the applications are agnostic or where they run. You can be killed in your slave and start uh, running in, in the slave near, nearby, in the agent nearby. Um, and this is a picture of how many clusters do we have. Um, currently, in red, we have uh, four clusters in AWS. Uh, and in gray, we have cl physical clusters in, inside the data center. All of them are mesos. So we have four production mesos. Uh, and it's only defined by the environment. When you deploy your application, you just choose which, which environment you, you prefer your application to run. And you land your, your blob, your Docker, in, inside mesos. Then we have a big QA uh, cluster where everyone exercises their applications. And uh, we have an intermittent uh, data processing cluster that we kill and spawn and reorganize. And we, we try to uh, use it for figuring out uh, our, our future workloads in, in, in terms of data processing. Uh, all of them are connected uh, through Kafka's. Every data center has a Kafka uh, cluster, and in turn, all the Kafka's spill their data into the main data processing uh, Kafka. And with that, I will switch to data processing. Um, 
So um, one, one of the things, the, the, the beginning of the talk was just about the, how we run applications and, 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 and how we make this process sane in a way that let uh, everyone in the company just deploy within a, a day in the company. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about how we, we are trying to manage the complexity of data processing using Mesos. Um, for that, I, I, will, I will mention Spark. Uh, Spark has been uh, a, a great uh, success for us. Uh, we've been using Spark for over a year and a half now. Um, and uh, if you don't know what Spark is, it's, uh, it's a sister project from Mesos. They both uh, were born, uh, born in the AMP lab in UC Berkeley. Um, Actually, Matei Saharia, the guy who, uh, who started Spark, uh, started it as a sample framework, to, uh, the first sample framework uh, for, for Mesos. Um, and they introduced um, a generalized way of treating map-reduced computations. Um, they, they do that by uh, providing a general direct acyclic graph. Um, and they provide many uh, bindings for many languages, Java, Scala, Python, uh, SQL, R. And they also treat uh, all the, the modes of computations uh, uh, within the same framework, batch processing, interactive processing, and online processing. So to understand Sparks, one has to understand uh, Sparks RDD. RDDs are resilient distributed data sets uh, or uh, fault-tolerant distributed collections. And those collections can be made uh, by parallelizing uh, existing collections. Um, so you get a collection, you execute parallelize, and they automatically get distributed in, in, in the cluster. Or via external data sets, uh, that is anything that is compatible with the, or supported by Hadoop, including the local file system, HDFS, Cassandra, Amazon S3. Um, so once you have an RDD, uh, Spark treats the contents of this RDD uh, with partitions. So in, in this graph, when we fetch a file from Hadoop, uh, we already partition it in four pieces. So um, um, every time we do an operation on, 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 on the first RDD to produce the second RDD, the, the scheduler provides a task for every operation in every partition. So if you have four partitions, the scheduler will generate four tasks, one task per every partition operation. Um, so the, I, I will try to explain the lifetime. This is also very well explained by Matei Saharaya himself in, a, in an old video of uh, two years ago. But I will try to explain it again in the context of Mesos. So it's, uh, it's uh, much better understood why Spark and Mesos are a very good combination. Um, for example, this simple program in Spark that it's a, a collection RDD1, join another collection RDD2, uh, and then group by, and then produce a filter, a filter creates this uh, graph of data sets. And that, in turn, gets transformed into um, a DAG uh, graph, a graph of all the stages that uh, need to be produced in order to process these partitions. So every blue square in this DAG scheduler is one partition. Um, so the DAG scheduler finds opportunities in pipelining operations and collapsing stages, and only defining stages uh, that uh, can be executed uh, in, in the cluster. So you, you, you find stages that you can submit to the, to the cluster manager, and the cluster manager is agnostic about the, how the scheduler uh, organizes his work. It's just receiving work to do, and then he tries to um, send the work out to workers. Uh, the workers are very, very, very simple. It's just um, uh, a thread pool, so you can execute uh, uh, your, your tasks. And a block manager that is uh, responsible for fetching and, and operating on, on the data. Um, the good thing about this way of thinking is that uh, uh, the DAG scheduler is agnostic about the operation. So uh, in programmers, programmer land, you can create and define several operations, group by key, or filter by key, and, and type. I don't know. You can create many, many operations. 
and then you only need to provide a way to transform these operations into a DAG representation, and that's it. The DAG scheduler will, auto will automatically try to figure out what to do with the, with the DAG. Uh, if you are interested in optimizing the scheduler, you just focus on the DAG scheduler and try to see how you can collapse and, and optimize that uh, stages and see opportunities for caching. And the task scheduler, it's also agnostic about the, the DAG scheduler. So the task scheduler just executes uh, it, uh, whatever he's been told to. Um, and the workers are just executing a piece of work. If they fail or succeed, they just announce it back. Uh, and, and every stage in this process is agnostic about the others. Um, this is an example of uh, alternating uh, less squares. That is a method for matrix multiplications. And that, that is performing uh, MLLib, uh, the library, uh, machine learning library for, for Spark. And in the latest release of uh, uh, Apache Spark, you have, uh, whenever you execute your tasks, you have the DAG, uh, the DAG visualization uh, available. So you can figure out uh, what are the things uh, that are going on. Every vertical division here, it's called a stage. And every stage can be executed in the cluster in parallel. So um, let's see how this is. Uh, uh, normally, uh, in a, Spark is agnostic uh, uh, about this, the, the, the cluster manager you use. You can use Yarn. You can use the, uh, a standalone. Or you can use even Databricks uh, owns uh, scheduler. But uh, normally, is you, you have a program that becomes the driver. And the driver talks to this cluster manager. And the cluster manager assigns work to nodes. And if you look at this picture, it's very much like uh, what you can do with the Spark, uh, with the Mesos. So there are two modes of operations if you want to run Spark on top of Mesos. Uh, one is the coarse grain. Um, in that case, uh, the, the Spark program becomes the framework. It, the Spark program registers itself as a framework and uses the Mesos master as the cluster manager and uses the worker nodes, the, the Mesos executors, to launch the, um, the Spark executor in turn. So you have a long-lived Spark executor in every slave. And then you submit pieces of this DAG that I mentioned uh, before through the master to execute in different, in different slaves. Um, when they, in turn, finish, they can also communicate uh, task between task and the results being communicated back to the driver program. There is also an, a, a, an option to run uh, Spark on Mesos in fine grain mode. Fine grain mode uh, is just similar, only that uh, every time you send a, a task to the, to the cluster to schedule, the cluster will run it in one single executor. So that means that uh, you have more fine grain control over the resources but you need to spend more time waiting until the task spins, because you need to download the Spark executor at every time. This can be alleviated with uh, the use of Docker, but um, uh, we will, uh, I recommend that we uh, use Spark on Mesos with coarse grain mode. Um, since sometimes you can, you can spin several, several uh, um, instances and occupy all the, the available resources in your cluster if you use the fine grain mode. Um, if, if you see Tim, Timothy Chen uh, here, he's, this guy is uh, my hero. He's been uh, pushing pull requests to, to make this happen, to make the reconciliation between Mesos and Spark again, I think. And, and if you follow this uh, pull request that some of them already uh, merged, uh, you will see uh, how useful it is to run uh, Spark on, on top of Mesos. The Docker support, Docker support for launching um, uh, your programs. There is a, 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 an option that it's called cluster that you can submit your driver program as a, a task in the cluster, and that task itself registered to to, to the master being a framework, and then you organize the, the, the execution of the DAG. Um, then we also have a, a way to specify constraints. Uh, we can say, run Spark only on slaves that are tagged uh, uh, with attribute SSD, 
or you know, if you have a, a heterogeneous type of slaves, you can mark them as these uh, slaves are for ads, these other slaves are for production workloads, uh, and then you can use the scheduler in, uh, in appropriate slaves. Um, also, the dynamic allocation is brand new that uh, you see announced in, in Mesos. Um, uh, there will be an option to provide a, a stretching on, on, on the allocations of, of resources that you need before, before running your task. Um, the ideal processing stack, uh, that, this is a slide I stole from Paco Nathan. He was a very good advocate of this uh, stack that I totally agree with. Uh, you have a, a kernel for the data center. Um, then you have a distributed file system that in our case is Amazon S3. Uh, then you have a memory-centric cache to speed up the computations that go in, into HDFS. And then on top of that, you run Spark with, the, with all these libraries, uh, Spark SQL, streaming, uh, machine learning, and graphic computations. Um, we were using Kronos and Marathon uh, with uh, um, great success. Um, we are considering using uh, other frameworks that are very fresh, Kafka and Mesos, uh, at least uh, for uh, uh, the foreseeable future. That's the way to go, um, because uh, SAMHSA on Mesos is another thing. SAMHSA provides a, uh, it's a framework for running uh, uh, string computations behind Kafka's. Uh, Phoenix is uh, very, very recent um, by Joe Stein, that is the guy who's going to talk up just after me. Uh, don't miss that talk. Um, it's a Secor, uh, that it's a, a, a backup application that backups your, your Kafka uh, streams into Amazon S3, he converted it into a, into a framework. So now you can schedule where to run your, your backups. Um, Cassandra on Mesos is something that we try with not so great success, so we need to uh, figure out how this will evolve over time. Uh, and this is a picture of what we do with data processing. Uh, we collect activity for our users and uh, uh, we pipe this activity through Amazon S3, and some, some of that activity lands in, in Cassandra for uh, uh, online processing. And we use two clusters, one provided by Databricks, and this is a hosted solution that you have to pay, but they run a, run a scheduler that is similar to Mesos. Um, I imagine it's similar to Mesos. Uh, we use that for, for data scientists to prototype and exercise uh, computations on the data, and then we are using a, an extra cluster just to, to productionize uh, and exercise Spark streaming that we, we have not uh, really put Spark streaming in production yet, but uh, we think uh, putting Spark streaming behind uh, Kafka will give us a, enough power to do uh, online computations and, and, and good data products. Um, this is some of the ETL uh, we do. We have uh, several logs in form of uh, JSON. Uh, and what we do is we use uh, Spark SQL to ingest JSON and operate uh, uh, that over that JSON with SQL. Um, we do matrix factorization. That it's um, very, very much the mechanism we use for collaborative filtering. We also use it for topic modeling. Um, and we have a recent project that is restaurant demand analysis that also uses time series and, and matrix factorization. Um, another exploration we are doing with uh, Spark um, uh, is word 2 vec uh, the model of uh, Skipgram. So in, in order to find the synonyms, we crawl all the reviews we have, the 25 million reviews in our corpus. Uh, and with word 2 vec uh, we train a model to find the synonyms of sushi. And you see the model knows very well all the words that are related to sushi. And we went uh, on, on uh, one more extent of uh, word to vec and we have found uh, a way to compute synonyms of restaurants. So say Akiko's 
is a, a very good uh, Japanese restaurant in San Francisco. <laughs> and we were able to find synonym restaurants only in different cities. And synonyms, uh, because we only use the content of the words to compare the similarity. Uh, so we found in Maui a very good uh, restaurant, uh, in Chicago, New York, and they, con when we look up the, f the photos, we find out they all have the uh, bar, like the first. Uh, and this is a pretty amazing result, and we are just uh, exploring this, uh, this part. And that's all I have. And this is me. Also, we are hiring, so if <laughs> I can take some questions, if there are any. Can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your service discovery? Yes. Uh, the question was, can you tell us uh, a little bit more about the service discovery? Um, this service discovery uh, mechanism is um, Eureka-like. So if you are looking something similar, we will, uh, I think we're going to open source this by, before the end of the year. Uh, but if you have a necessity now, this is very much how Eureka from Netflix works. So you have a client and you have a server and you register and you query the server to in order to find things. So, but every, every one of your uh, specific workload inside the Docker container needs to be aware of the API to find where other services are. You're not leveraging DNS or... No, no, exactly, exactly. Every, every application needs to have this library. So uh, we have uh, produced libraries for every language that we use in the company. And you just use this library in order to, to, to have HTTP conversations with other applications. Yeah. Sure. The question was, can uh, we talk about logging? Um, I have a full talk about logging, and it takes a long, long time to explain. But think of uh, a log stash. If you are familiar with log stash, we have a log stash, uh, a log stash plus Kafka um, a logging pipeline. So um, we have two libraries. One library for logging errors and HTTP conversation. So every time a, um, an HTTP enters uh, the edge of open table and it spins uh, uh, calls to other services, every service logs uh, that request uh, with a request ID. So then we can aggregate all the requests into a single request. Uh, the other thing we do is uh, we have an analytics library that it's uh, being used to every time a user hits our edge uh, uh, at open table, provided they have a unique identifier that it's a cookie or, or, or an identity, we log that identity throughout all the services. So then we can aggregate per user. So um, um, it's very, uh, Logstash, do uh, you find a lot of things uh, uh, in the internet about uh, Logstash? Uh, I, I'm happy to talk to you about it if you, if you want. One more? Oh. Yes. The question was, can we talk about uh, front door a little bit more? Um, front door is just um, a Java uh, HTTP um, proxy HTTP server and URL rewriting. So we can, we can have a URL that's open table slash best restaurants in the world. And that uh, um, natural language URL, we, get tra we transform it into a different URL that hits one of the services. Uh, it al it's also a proxy, so if you have a service in OpenTable that is not uh, aware of the discovery, it can hit front door internally, and front door will route you through the... Uh, and the way you configure it is very simple. You have a sample here in the last line. It says uh, request. Uh, you specify the path. And with the path alone, you can uh, you have a very expressive language to define um, uh, how you want to route this uh, this request. Um, also, uh, I believe there are plans to open source this by the end of the year. Um, yeah, um, it's okay. 
No more questions? Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs>